Hey, Yoas, you got to pass information along quickly. I don't have to give the whole story, but I have to get something across quickly. And you can imagine, you're in a nuclear sub, you're in a bunch of metal, uh, actually small nuclear power plant in the back of your sub, and you got <coughs> guys running around the sub who three months prior were in high school, you know, doing wheelies and drinking a lot of beer. Uh, that's what it's like. And that you had some ensign run up to you and give you some information that just wasn't clear at all. So that's what they started doing. I'm not going to show this one. I want to move on so that we get some questions or whatever else. Uh, adverse outcome index. Um, this is something that's somewhat new in OB. Uh, I think it's old now, but this is my world. <clears throat> but the idea of adverse outcome index was to look at how can we actually measure harm. Now, this is extremely subjective because what happened was some people from ACOG and Harvard got together and said, well, let's weight this and see you know, what our weighted score would, would be. But obviously, you can just have the frequency of these different things. Why is it these things? The reality was because this is what you can get from DRG data. So they can get it quickly. The problem is, is that our errors, while we know what they are, we don't have a good way to collect them quickly. You know that from your peer review. If someone's going to do peer review and there's an error or there's a problem, it takes a while to review that chart and understand really what was going on. So with your AOI, you can at least get a rough estimate of what's been going on in your <clears throat> hospital or with your practice. At Red Wing, uh, Christy and I uh, went down there. We had great people down there who just took the ball and ran with it. But we got a 37% reduction in the weighted score. Um, this ended up being published um, in the Joint Commission Journal of Quality. But it showed a 37% decrease in that. Um, the reason this was big was because it really was the first time that uh, Team Steps was put into simulation and showed a decrease in the actual harm. Uh, I won't go into that. This is the overall trend. I'm going to go past this too. I threw a lot in this. Um, oh, here's uh, from uh, from some of the grant work, pre-grant work, was that there were decreased liability claims. There were other things that we did, though, other than simulation and such, was we also did what are called perinatal bundles, which are basically process metrics. The idea is that our outcomes are so rare that if you really want to look at if you're getting better or not, you have to look at your process. And so the process is, can you take four things, say it was four things around doing an induction. And did you do the four things that you needed to do before an induction? Did you check the cervix? Do you understand what tachysystole is? These kinds of things. And then you, you have your checklist. Did you do all four? Then you can see, OK, well, on our checklist, we only did it correctly 90% of the time. Then you look next month, and you realize, hey, we did it 100% of the time. That's how you can see if you're getting better in terms of <coughs> process metrics. Um, I'll come back to this one at time. Okay. The airline industry um, has done a remarkable job of reducing um, crashes. There have only been two uh, American carriers that have crashed since 2006. Um, and that's not what it was like when I was a kid. I know that for a fact. Um, lots of things go into that, um, technology obviously, but also pilot training and uh, team steps work, teamwork. <clears throat> this is in uh, the um, pilot's lounge, or I should say their area for doing their flight, flight plan. <clears throat> and it's a reminder that they need to have what's called a sterile cockpit. A sterile cockpit is where when they're doing their briefing and their checklist, there isn't to be any idle talk. They're not supposed to be talking about what they had for dinner last night, what's going on with Susie, their six-year-old. So during the checklist, it's considered sacrosanct. Secondly, there's no input from the tower. 
There's no input from the flight attendant. Nobody is getting into that sterile cockpit. So that's how sacrosanct they consider that briefing in terms of when they're going. Um, why is that important? Because you'll see often that when people are trying to give information to each other on labor and delivery, there will be interruptions. And then, did I tell her that? Did I tell him that? Did I forget? So what happened? So this is one concept of the briefing and other information transfers that you have to think about. So uh, with that, I've got five minutes for questions. Um, I love this. The only thing required for learning is humility. Um, I think that's kind of uh, where we're at, is that we need to kind of refocus on how we provide health care and think more in the terms of a team approach and the physician as the team leader. But we were never taught that in either medical school or residency, is how to be a team leader. So with that, I discussion, talk, questions. Well, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> all I can tell you is this. The FAA requires uh, cockpit simulation every year. Um, <clears throat> United Airlines does it every nine months. In terms of for uh, health care, we've seen it done where you do it intensely and come back and do it a year later. Nobody knows that. There's no research on that. Um, but, you know, you're talking about uh, the thing called degradation. What is degradation over time? And that's part of our problem. That's part of the problem with the uh, Japanese nuclear power or the oil platform. Not necessarily degradation, but it's the fact that sustainment started to drift. The best example of that and drift in our world is the 39-week elective inductions. We used to be really good at that. And then what happened was, well, she delivered 39 weeks, there was no problem. Oh, she delivered at 38 weeks, there's no problem. Oh, she delivered at 37 and 3 sevenths, that was no problem. And so now there's an induction at 37 weeks and problem. As a matter of fact, my one story in that was there was an OB that was delivered by primary C-section, did not labor, just wanted to have her C-section. <clears throat> she was delivered at 38 weeks and her baby spent 10 days in the NICU. Um, that's not good. So anyway, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah. How do you propose that we retrain us old physicians who recognize Marcus Welby yeah. as being team leaders? Because none of us in our medical experience ever had any of those type of classes. Now I understand it's routine. But yeah. Well, and I don't know how good a job they're doing either. Uh, the, the other thing I want to point out there is that typically when you go to China, you don't change Chinese culture. That's what I've found. So a new medical student, new nursing student, when they come, they're the, they're the American, and they're going into China, right? There's already a big culture already fit here that they're being uh, subjected to, and more likely the culture is going to change them, and they're going to change the culture. So the, this is a problem. It's not something that we just need to say, hey, let's let all the old parts retire, and it's going to be wonderful. The idea, then, is through the simulation, the hope is that you will start to see some of this stuff. The things that you can start doing tomorrow that would be uh, show leadership is to model the behavior. Uh, modeling the behavior would be that you use closed loop communication and understand it's a three-step process. If I say I need 0.2 milligrams of methogen and I didn't hear my nurse repeat it, I'd say closed loop communication, I need to hear it back. If the nurse doesn't hear you respond yes, then she says, I didn't hear, is that right? That's how you start doing that coaching, peer-to-peer -peer coaching. I like to liken it to smoking. If someone came in 40 years ago and was smoking in here, you'd hit bum a cigarette off them. But now if they came in, you'd say, you can't smoke here. It's everyone teaching everyone. Uh, that's the idea. In terms of other aspects of leadership for a physician, is I would take on the idea of doing briefings. Take on the idea of doing debriefings. Uh, the other thing I would uh, do 
is I would understand that a lot of this is behavioral, a lot of it's psychology, and it's no more difficult than Pavlov's bell and the salivation. It really isn't. It's just that we need to employ it. So one of the things you can think about is that when you come into a room, is that you ask for an S-bar, or you get an S-bar. The reason that's important is because, you remember that first one with the doctor lost situational awareness? And he said, oh, we better do a C-section now. When he came into the room, the first thing he did was he went over to the strip. Okay, that's exactly what you don't want to do as a leader. He got into a task, and now he lost the big picture. The first thing he should have done was when he crosses a threshold to say, I need an SBAR. And just look the patient in the eye, and I need that information. Now I can go do what I need to do. Um, I found this in my own practice when I was in the uh, doing the in-house call, as I did a lot of it. The first year, no one wanted to do it, so I was doing it all the time. And what happened was I realized exactly that, is if I came in the room and I said I need an S-bar, the nurses would give me an S-bar, and then I could go on and do what I did. Well, what happened after about three weeks of that? They started doing what you want to do. Exactly. Oh, there's Dr. That they also did, oh, there's Dr. Davis, I better do it. I'm not sure if they did it with everybody else, but that's the idea. Um, because it's easier for the person walking into the room to do it than for the nurse to do it. Let's say there is a, a terminal bradycardia. I'll make this quick because I know we're over time. Terminal bradycardia, what is the nurse doing? About five different things. Turn the left, oxygen, blah, 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 IV up. They aren't all of a sudden going to turn and salute you and say, here's your SBAR doctor. They need a reminder. Hey, I need an SBAR. Oh, okay. Let me get off my task real quick, give you the information. Now we can move forward because you could easily lose situational awareness that way. Nurse to nurse, same thing. When Christy and I do this, and I can almost guarantee it will happen today in one of the two simulations, what will happen is, the first nurse will be doing exactly that, all of her tasks. The second nurse comes in, and what would you do if you had a lot of tasks that you had to do? You'd want to get one off your plate. So it's Sally's the first nurse, Bobby's the second nurse. Sally says to Bobby, hey, Bobby, could you put an IV in for me? Bobby goes to put in the IV, and she doesn't know a thing about the patient. Doctor comes in, Sally's on the phone with the blood bank, what's going on? Oh, I don't know. Just putting in an IV. Yeah. You just took all of her, uh, grad, her nursing experience, you just took all of that, those student loans, all of those years of anguish with uh, the Krebs cycle, and you made her an IV, put her in her. She's no longer a nurse. That's the idea. So... As physicians, the leadership, first thing is you have to model behavior. The second is to understand this isn't rocket science. This is really not that tough. And actually, if you start doing it, it just falls into place. Like I said, I didn't need to ask for an S-bar anymore. I just walk in the room, there it is. So it's, um, it's culture work. Culture takes a long time to change. Anything else? So your, to your point about consistency and risk of degradation, mm -hmm. I was recently at the local community college for the senior nurses students from it, mm -hmm. and they were very persistent and very consistent about call-outs and closed loop communication and all the techniques that we talk about in team steps. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't see that in teams of us because we polluted people in China. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. with our old-fashioned kind of communication. Right. Um, I'll take that as a good point, uh, but what I'll add to that is that as you do this work, uh, there's this thing called Rogers Diffusion of Innovation. It's basically a bell curve, if you've seen it. And you got the innovators, they're going to take it and run with it. And then you got the um, early adopters, you got to get those people going. Because the next, by the time you know it, the late adopters are going to come on. Just think of the cell phone. I'm not going to do that cell phone. Look at that thing. It's this huge. That's silly. That's ridiculous. Cost 
hundred dollars a month, or it still costs a hundred dollars a month. <laughs> but, you know, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So that's that's the uh, that's the science behind adapting that. It's the science behind adapting technology. It's the science behind adapting to a new culture. So you just have to hope that you get out there as the innovators and early adopters, and that uh, the rest of the people will follow. On, on that line, you know, there, there's that that late adopters that would be still tied at home to their phone if they had to be, but. We see that with physicians, just like the guy with the kidney who didn't want to be dealing with any of, of the things that everybody else in the team wanted to do. Right. Um, and so are there any, I don't know, I feel like I have a question without an answer that what do you do for those real stragglers that are still in the, I'm the doctor, don't question me. Right. Um, kind of thing? Well, there are, in Rogers Diffusion of Innovation, the very end of it, uh, probably the two standard deviations out, yeah. um, 2.5 percent, whatever. Um, those are called the laggards, yeah. and the laggards. Some of those laggards probably do have to die. <laughs> uh, now you could you could look at that passively or aggressively. <laughs> um, I recommend passively, <laughs> um, but. You can, uh, someone said it here at the very beginning, lead a horse to water. Yeah, make it very Yeah, so. Are we supposed to have this great beam of light saying, well, here's the, the three techniques. The, the, be, the beam of light would be the fact that you're behaving in a way that no one else behaves like. That you've already got everyone doing this, and the next thing they know, oh, I better get on board with this. Uh, that's the idea, is don't, and as a matter of fact, don't spend your time on it. That's the last thing you want to do. Don't spend your time on them at all. The classic, well not the classic, one of the business uh, mantras is take your B players and make them A players. Don't work with the C and D players until you get those B players to A players. Yep. I've been lucky enough to work in lots of different systems because I was a locums for years. Mm -hmm. And one of the systems at St. Vincent's in Indianapolis should even start clinic with a debriefing and a huddle, mm -hmm. even if it's just pediatric clinic. Yeah. You, know, you look at all the potential problems, what paperwork are we missing, um, and then you debrief at the end of the day. And it was expected. If you were running a clinic there, you did that. For right. It. Yeah. It's it the ex well. You know what it is? That's the word, is expectation. Mm -hmm. It's our expectation that you will do this. Um, that sounds more administrative, uh, but that can be cultural too. Well, the physicians can expect it of each other. Right, right. Uh, well, in culture, in Minnesota, uh, I think of this all the time actually, because uh, I, I, it's very helpful to live somewhere else and then come back to Minnesota, and I did that. I, I lived uh, about 12 years of my life outside of Minnesota. Man, do we open doors for people. It's just, it's, it's almost expected, especially if it's a man opening a door for a woman. When I was in San Diego, even Salt Lake City, which is, you know, full of nice people, uh, that didn't happen. So there's a cultural difference. And it's almost expected. I'm going to open it, you know. So that's just the way it works. How do you create that culture where, you know, like the, the laggard, you don't just keep caving for the, the squeaky wheel? Yeah, well, definitely don't do that. Um, it, you ultimately, <laughs> if you push it far enough, it ultimately comes down to a human resource problem. Because what's happening then is that you're going uh, from at-risk behavior to reckless behavior, meaning reckless non-behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because... Um, you can try to change the world, but it won't change for you necessarily. You know, I mean, I hate to get too philosophical, but that's the way it is there. Like I said, some people might have to die, but the idea that, you know, someone's not playing along, you eventually have to say, you know what, the way we do things here in Wilmer is like this. And we'd like you to come along, but if you can't seem to do it, then maybe you need to work somewhere else. That's the human resource element. You know, you get so far. And that becomes an administrative problem. Um, but, you know, I, there are plenty of examples of people just not watching what's going on, and then there's the error. But most error, though, is system-related. 
So I guess if I was to leave you with one thing is let's stop blaming individuals and look at how can we improve the system. Real quick example on that because the Winter Olympics are coming up. Christy, you probably got to be so tired of all my examples because I use the same ones pretty much all the time. Never tired. Okay. Winter Olympics are coming up. Okay, watch for the losers. If you remember the last Winter Olympics, there was a loser who flew off and hit a pole and died. The International Olympic Committee, this still boggles my mind to this day, two days later comes out and says that it was operator error. As a matter of fact, you know the plane, the Korean plane that crashed in San Francisco? One day after that plane crashed, the CEO of the Korean airline says, well, it had to have been operator error. Give me a break. <laughs> in one day, he's figured out what's going on with that. It's the human condition to want to blame an individual. We have a name for it. It's called the fall guy. So what happened with the loser? Well, they found out the track was too long. They found out the track was too fast. That corner was too fast. And well, so they really find out? They found out that no one put padding on that pole. So when you hear about a human error or some problem, don't look to the individual. Right now, we've got the train in Brooklyn. Now, obviously, it sounds like the guy dazed off. He said he dazed off. Rather than looking at him, the idea in improvement is to look at what put him into that position. In other words, why did he daze off? Maybe he was up 24 hours. I don't know. But that's what you have to start looking at. And if we have guys who are up 24 hours and they're not rested, what are we going to do to make sure that that train doesn't come into the corner at 87 miles an hour versus 40 miles an hour? Because well, obviously we've braking systems that they should have had so that no train could enter that track at that speed. That's exactly right. So sometimes your answer is technology. Sometimes your answer is human. The human part of this that I'm telling you about is called in the big world it's called uh, human factors, and there are actually people who get PhDs in human factors uh, because they are doing the science around that work. The science around what the, what makes it, the mantra of human factors is how do you make it easy for people to do the right thing. And I'll say it again, how do you make it easy for people to do the right thing? That's what I want. That's what I wanted at work. I come in and it's easy to do my job. There's no, you know, you know we had a uh, saying in resident, residency, it's never about the patient. And what we meant by that was that all your hassles and all your, the things you were complaining about really weren't about the pathology of the patient or the patient. There's always something around that. Um, so that's the idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah.